Bev again with a two-part video. First part is going to be on um, exercise, and the second part is going to have a motorcycle story that is about my husband and I when my husband nearly died on a motorcycle, okay? It was very scary, and I'm going to share it with you. So, I'll have a drink of wine so that I'm a bit more relaxed talking about that story. First thing I want to say is working out without a training plan is like going on a road trip without a map, right? So, when you train, you want to tra you want to use training programs and change them every 4 to 9 weeks so that you surprise your body, it doesn't get a chance to adapt too well and uh, and you can grow more muscle, right? But I've got another little trick for you, um, and that involves um, both isometric and isotonic exercise. Uh, you know, you can provide more difficulty for your muscles if you know about moment arms, right? We know that isometric exercise is the kind where, uh, you know, you hold your your joint in one position and you don't move it, and isotonic is where you're actually moving a joint, okay? So, and what we'll do is we'll take dumbbell and by, by, uh, barbell curls as an example. Um, but let's see what we're talking about here in terms of exercise. So, the moment arm is the lever arm. Okay, I'm not talking about arms, I just mean in exercise. Uh, it is the perpendicular distance between the muscle's line of action and the center of rotation. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, you can, you can Google it after, but we'll talk about what the result is of this, which is what you'll want to know about. Uh, the axis, um, this is the axis about which the force causes rotation. Uh, of the joint and it determines the quality of the torque, okay? Now I studied uh, physics, um, nuclear physics, but one of my courses was mechanical physics, which I absolutely loved, and working out is really mechanical physics. It's a study of forces, okay? So, when we think of this moment arm, every joint movement has a moment arm. I don't care what exercise you're doing or what joint you're moving. And so the longer that moment arm is, the more load will be applied to the joint axis through leverage. So it means that your muscle is going to work harder when we're talking about this isometric, okay? I'm not saying not to do isotonic, I'm just explaining the difference between the two. So you're going to increase your time under tension uh, at the hardest part if we use this isometric properly, okay? So if, if I was to do, uh, let me just see. Let's talk about a curl, okay? I don't care if it's barbell or dumbbell. So you have your elbow joint, right? And sometimes your arm is, is hanging down. Your hands are down here. And then you move the hands up and the weights are up here, right? So they're down at the bottom or you're moving them up and down. Now, the moment arm at the bottom is nothing, right? It's easy at the bottom, right? They're just hanging there. And at the top, right? You could hold them up at the top for a lot longer, right? Than in the middle. As you travel through here, how hard that exercise is changes. As you move up, the hardest it is, is right here. When your arms are parallel to the floor, this is the hardest this exercise will be, and that is the longest the moment arm is. Okay? When we talk about leverage. Um, so, if you, as you come up past this, okay, it gets harder, Hardest, harder, easy. So, if you, if you pass through the hardest, that's fine. Most of us do, right, when we're doing bicep curls. 
But if you stop at the hardest and count to three, right? One, two, three, up, stop again, one, two, three, down. You are really going to make that bicep work harder. And another way to do it is to stop a third of the way up and, and then stop two thirds the way up. And that will increase the um, strength at these points about uh, three to five percent on either side of those stopping points. You know, whether you stop here, 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 you can do different things, okay? So uh, it's true about bench press as well. If you're sitting on a bench press, uh, you know, stop halfway and then go all the way up, stop halfway, come all the way down. You're going to work a hell of a lot harder, all right, with your muscles. Um, now, I want to say the story about Dave. Okay. In 2016, we were on a motorcycle trip and we were headed to, we were actually headed to New Mexico. So in this particular case, it's this green one. And it was in uh, 2016. So we came down, you know, and actually the funny thing is he got a new tire in Texarkana. Uh, we had it down. We were at Galveston, whatever. We were coming along here. And we were near San Angelo in kind of the southwest uh, part of Texas. This is a picture of him with the bike. Anyway, we were... We were traveling to New Mexico because I wanted to go to Roswell, New Mexico, right? Um, and it, it started off in the morning. It was quite nice. We were in the hills, gorgeous. And, um, and then it started to rain and it, it got worse. Now, when you're on a motorcycle, you know, you don't stop in the rain because well, you could be there forever, right? In a rain pocket. You just keep on going, right? When you're traveling on a motorcycle distance, you're ready for cold weather, hot weather, rainy weather, whatever. So we just pulled over to the side of the road and we put on our rain gear. And Dave's pants um, were these uh, rubberized pants. I, I had a different pair, but he had these rubberized pants. So he was on a Honda Goldwing, which if you know anything about motorcycles, I mean, it's a thousand pounds. It's a huge bike, right? Uh, and he has a lot of experience. He's 300,000 kilometers on bikes, right? I have 400,000. And I'm traveling, I always travel behind him on, um, on my Harley. So he's ahead of me by, I don't know, 30 feet. And anyway, it's really, really heavy rain. So uh, there's a truck behind us. And, you know, I'm always checking behind me. There's no cars in the passing lane, but there's a truck behind us. Now, it is a highway, so it's a four-laner. Um, but it's not an interstate, so it hasn't been built to the same specifications. So the wheel wells have sunk down in the heat, right? We know in Texas there's high heat. So the wheel wells have sunk down, but there's tons of rain, so they're full of water. Now what you do on a motorcycle, normally you're in the wheel wells, right? But, or where the wheels normally are, but because of the rain, you travel up in the middle, so you're not caught in that. But I think what happened to Dave, um, well, let me tell you what, first of all, what, what I saw. I'm traveling behind him. I looked down. I don't know what I looked down for. I looked down for something and I looked up. Oh my God. He was completely perpendicular to me. And I thought, geez. So I pulled out. I knew nobody was in the passing lane. I didn't want to run over him. And fortunately, this uh, truck behind us pulled out as well to not run over him. And when I passed, I looked to the right and he and the motorcycle were traveling down the road together, side by side at 100 kilometers an hour. That's how fast we were going when this accident happened. We were going, weren't going that fast. I don't know what that is, about 65 miles an hour. Anyway, I, it was heavy rain, so I just grabbed, I took my, you know, I, I just gradually came to a stop there wasn't much side to the road, so I got off as well as I could, and I thought, oh my God, Dave's gonna be dead. I mean, I have to tell you, uh, it was the scariest thing ever. And I turned around, and he was walking towards me. And what had happened 
is um, I think his back wheel got kind of stuck in that uh, pile of water in, in one of the uh, wheel wells and he kind of hydroplaned sideways and he held on as long as he could and then he came off the bike and he remembers sliding down the road. Remember he had those rubber pants sliding down the road and uh, the bike um, went off the road at about 30 degree angle and I have to tell you it was a complete total write-off. You know, the handlebars were crushed in. I, I mean, I could show you a picture of the bike. You wouldn't believe it. Um, and uh, complete write-off. But Dave survived, right? And he said he remembers sliding down the road. He could feel it on the side of him, uh, his, his thighs and everything. And he got huge bruises. But they were only on the outside of his body. And apparently the blood clots, you worry about them if you have bruises on the inside of the legs, not on the outside. So uh, anyway, the cops came and we got the bike picked up and taken. And we, you know, we, we dumped, we didn't have collision insurance because, I mean, geez, you know, if you're going to have an accident on a bike, you're usually dead. So who cares, right? So we have all sorts of liability, but we don't have collision insurance, right? So we knew no way for the bike, even though he got a new tire and Texarkana on the same trip. Anyway, we dumped the bike for a hundred bucks. We had to ship my bike home. We had to fly home. It was so scary. Dave never rode a bike for a year. He has a new bike now, but it was the scariest thing. I was around biking myself for the rest of 2016 and into early 2017 on my own. And uh, anyway, he got back into the biking, but you know what? He survived. You have to be prepared on bikes for all sorts of weather, all sorts of incidents. And, um, you know, he survived. Anyway, talk to you in the next video. Bye for now.